whispered audiobook reading of Agatha Christie's The Murder on the Links. So in this episode we pick up with Poirot and Hastings once more in chapter 20, An Amazing Statement. The next morning, Poirot embraced me warmly. Enfin, you have arrived. And, all by yourself, it is superb. Continue your reasoning. You are right. Decidedly, we have done wrong to forget Georges Connaud. I was so flattered by the little man's approval that I could hardly continue. But at last, I collected my thoughts and went on. Georges Canot disappeared twenty years ago, but we have no reason to believe that he is dead. Aucunement, agreed Poirot. Proceed. Therefore, we will assume that he is alive. Exactly. Or that he was alive recently. De muse on mer. We will presume, I continued, my enthusiasm rising, that he has fallen on evil days. He has become a criminal, an Apache, a tramp, a what you will. He chances to come to Merlinville. There he finds the woman he has never ceased to love. Eh, eh, the sentimentality warned Poirot. Where one hates, one also loves, I quoted or misquoted. At any rate, he finds her there, living under an assumed name. But she has a new lover, the Englishman, Renaud. Georges Gounod, the memory of old wrongs rising in him, quarrels with this Renaud. He lies in wait for him as he comes to visit his mistress and stabs him in the back. Then, terrified of what he has done, he starts to dig a grave. I imagine it is likely that Madame de Broglie comes out to look for her lover. She and Canot have a terrible scene. He drags her into the shed and there suddenly falls down in an epileptic fit. Now, supposing Jacques Renaud to appear, Madame de Broy tells him all, points out to him the dreadful consequences to her daughter if this scandal of the past is revived. His father's murderer is dead. Let them do their best to hush it up. Jacques Renaud consents, goes to the house and has an interview with his mother, winning her over to his point of view. Primed with the story that Madame de Broglie has suggested to him, she permits herself to be gagged and bound. There, Poirot, what do you think of that? I leaned back flushed with the pride of successful reconstruction. Poirot looked at me thoughtfully. I think that you should write for the Kinema, mon ami, he remarked at last. You mean, it would make a good film, the story that you have recounted to me now, but it bears no sort of resemblance to everyday life. I admit that I haven't gone into all the details, but you have gone further. You have ignored them magnificently. What about the way the two men were dressed? Do you suggest that after stabbing his victim, Connor removed his suit of clothes, donned it himself? and replace the dagger. I don't see that that matters, I objected rather huffily. He may have obtained clothes and money from Madame de Broglie by threats earlier in the day. 
by threat say you seriously advance that supposition certainly he could have threatened to reveal her identity to the Reynolds which would probably have put an end to all hopes of her daughter's marriage you are wrong Hastings he could not blackmail her for she had the whip and Georges Cano remember you still want it for murder a word from her and he is in danger of the guillotine I was forced rather reluctantly to admit the truth of this your theory I remarked acidly is doubtless correct as to all the details my theory is the truth said Poirot quietly and the truth is necessarily correct in your theory you have made a fundamental error you permitted your imagination to lead you astray with midnight assignations and passionate love scenes but in investigating crime we must take our stand upon the commonplace shall I demonstrate my methods to you oh by all means let us have a demonstration Poirot sat very upright and began wagging his forefinger emphatically to emphasize his points I will start as you started from the basic facts of Georges Conneau now the story told by Madame Borali in court as to the Russians was admittedly a fabrication if she was innocent of connivance in the crime it was concocted by her and by her only as stated if on the other hand she was not innocent it might have been invented by either her or Georges Cano now in this case we are investigating we meet the same tale as I pointed out to you the facts render it very unlikely that Madame de Broglie inspired it so we turn the hypothesis that this story had its origin in the brain of Georges Cano very good Georges Cano therefore planned the crime with Madame Renault as his accomplice she is in the limelight and behind her is a shadowy figure whose alias is unknown to us now let us go carefully over the Renault case from the beginning setting down each significant point in its chronological order you have a notebook and pencil good now what is the earliest point to note down the letter to you that was the first we knew of it but it is not the proper beginning of the case the first point of any significance I should say is the change that came over Monsieur Renaud shortly after arriving in Merlinville and which is attested to by several witnesses we have also to consider his friendship with Madame de Broglie and the large sum of money paid over to her from thence we can come directly to the 23rd of May <coughs> Poirot paused cleared his throat and signed to me to write 23rd of May Monsieur Renaud quarrels with his son over the latter's wish to marry Martha de Broglie son leaves for Paris 24th of May Monsieur Renaud alters his will leaving entire control of his fortune in his wife's hands 7th of June quarrel with Trump in garden witnessed by Martha de Broglie letter written to Monsieur Hercule Poirot 
imploring assistance. Delacre sent to Jacques Renaud, bidding him proceed by the Anzora to Buenos Aires. Chauffeur masters sent off on a holiday. Visit of a lady that evening, as he is seeing her out, his words are, Yes, yes, but for God's sake, go now. Poirot paused. There, Hastings, take each one of those facts, one by one. Consider them carefully by themselves and in relation to the old, and see if you do not get new light on the matter. I endeavoured conscientiously to do as he had said. After a moment or two, I said, rather doubtfully, as to the first two points, the question seems to be whether we adopt the theory of blackmail or of an infatuation for this woman. Blackmail, decidedly, you heard what Stoner said as to his character and habits. Mrs. Renault did not confirm his view, I argued. We have already seen that Madame Renault's testimony cannot be relied upon in any way. We must trust to Stoner on that point. Still, if Renault had an affair with a woman called Bella, there seems no inherent improbability in his having another with Madame de Broy. None whatever, I grant you, Hastings, but did he? The letter, Poirot, you forget the letter. No, I do not forget, but what makes you think that the letter was written to Monsieur Renard? Why, it was found in his pocket, and, and, and that is all, cut in Poirot. There was no mention of any name to show to whom the letter was addressed. We assumed it was to the dead man because it was in the pocket of his overcoat. Now, mon ami, something about that overcoat struck me as unusual. I measured it and made the remark that he wore his overcoat very long. That remark should have given you to think. I thought you were just saying it for the sake of saying something, I confessed. Ah, Kelly D. Later you observed me measuring the overcoat of Monsieur Jacques Renaud. Eh bien, Monsieur Jacques Renaud wears his overcoat very short. Put those two facts together with a third, namely that Monsieur Jacques Renaud flung out of the house in a hurry on his departure for Paris, and tell me what you make of it. I see, I said slowly, as the meaning of Poirot's remarks bore in upon me. That letter was written to Jacques Renaud, not his father. He caught up the wrong overcoat in his haste and agitation. Poirot nodded précisément. We can return to a later point. For the moment, let us content ourselves with accepting the letter as having nothing to do with Monsieur Renaud père, and pass to the next chronological event. May the 23rd, I read, Monsieur Renaud quarrels with his son over the latter's wish to marry Martha de Broy. Son leaves for Paris. I don't see anything much to remark upon there, and the altering of the will the following day seems straightforward enough. It was the direct result of the quarrel. We agree, mon ami, at least as to the cause, but what exact motive underlay this procedure of Monsieur Renaud's? 
I opened my eyes in surprise. Anger against his son, of course. Yet he wrote in affectionate letters to Paris. So Jacques Renault says, but he cannot produce them. Well, let us pass from that. Now we come to the day of the tragedy. You have placed the events of the morning in a certain order. Have you any justification for that? I have ascertained that the letter to me was posted at the same time as the telegram was dispatched. Masters was informed he could take a holiday shortly afterwards. In my opinion, the quarrel with the tramp took place anterior to these happenings. I do not see that you can fix that definitely, unless you question Mademoiselle de Broy again. There is no need. I am sure of it. And if you do not see that, you see nothing, Hastings. I looked at him for a moment. Of course, I am an idiot. If the tramp was Georges Canot, it was after the stormy interview with him that Mr. Renault apprehended danger. He sent away the chauffeur, Masters, whom he suspected of being in the other's pay. He wired to his son and sent for you. A faint smile crossed Poirot's lips. You do not think it is strange that he should use exactly the same expressions in his letter as Madame Renault used later in her story. If the mention of Santiago was applied, why should Reynolds speak of it and, what is more, send his son there? It is puzzling, I admit, but perhaps we shall find some explanation later. We come now to the evening and the visit of the mysterious lady. I confess that that fairly baffles me, unless it was Madame de Broy, as Francoise all along maintained. Poirot shook his head. My friend, my friend, where are your wits wandering? Remember the fragment of Jack, and the fact that the name Bella Duvine was faintly familiar to Stoner, and I think we may take it for granted that Bella Duvine is the full name of Jacques' unknown correspondent, and that it was she who came to the Villa Genevieve that night. Whether she intended to see Jack, or whether she meant all along to appeal to his father, we cannot be certain. But I think we may assume that this is what occurred. She produced her claim upon Jacques, probably showed letters that he had written her, and the older man tried to buy her off by writing a cheque. This she indignantly tore up. The terms of her letter are those of a woman genuinely in love, and she would probably deeply resent being offered money. In the end, he got rid of her, and here the words that he used are significant. Yes, yes, but for God's sake, go now, I repeated. Mm, they seem to be a little vehement, perhaps, that is all. That is enough. He was desperately anxious for the girl to go. Why? Not only because the interview was unpleasant. No. It was the time that was slipping by, and for some reason, time was precious. Why should it be? I asked, bewildered. That is what we ask ourselves. Why should it be? But later, we have the incident of the wristwatch, which again shows us that time plays a very important part in the crime. 
We are now fast approaching the actual drama. It is half past ten when Bella Duvine leaves, and by the evidence of the wristwatch, we know that the crime was committed, or at any rate that it was staged before twelve o'clock. We have reviewed all the events anterior to the murder. There remains only one unplaced. By the doctor's evidence, the tramp, when found, had been dead at least 48 hours, with a possible margin of 24 hours more. Now, with no other facts to help me than those we had discussed, I place the death as having occurred on the morning of June the 7th. I stared at him, stupefied. But how? Why? How can you possibly know? Because only in that way can the sequence of events be logically explained. Mon ami, I have taken you step by step along the way. Do you not now see what is so glaringly plain? My dear Poirot, I can't see anything glaring about it. I did think I was beginning to see my way before, but I'm now hopelessly fogged. Poirot looked at me sadly and shook his head. Mon Dieu, but it is triste, a good intelligent, and so deplorably lacking in method. There is an exercise most excellent for the development of the little grey cells. I will impart it to you. For heaven's sake, not now. You really are the most irritating of fellows, Poirot. For goodness sake, get on and tell me you killed Monsieur Renaud. That is just what I am not sure of as yet. You said it was glaringly clear. Ah, uh, we talk at cross purposes, my friend. Remember, it is two crimes we are investigating, for which, as I pointed out to you, we have the necessary two bodies. There, there, ne vous en patientez pas. I explain all. To begin with, we apply our psychology. We find three points at which Monsieur Renaud displays a distinct change of view and action. Three psychological points, therefore. The first occurs immediately after arriving in Merlinville. The second after quarrelling with his son on a certain subject. The third on the morning of June. Seventh. Now, for the three causes, we can attribute number one to meeting Madame de Bruy. Number two is indirectly connected with her, since it concerns a marriage between Monsieur Renaud's son and her daughter. But the cause of number three is hidden from us. We have to deduce it. Now, mon ami, let me ask you a question. Who do you believe to have planned this crime? Georges Canot, I said doubtfully, eyeing Moira warily. Exactly. Now Giroux laid it down as an axiom that a woman lies to save herself. The man she loves, and her child. Since we are satisfied that was Georges Canot who dictated the lie to her, and as Georges Canot is not Jacques Renaud, follows that the third case is put out of our court. And still attributing the crime to Georges Canot, the first is equally so. So, we 
we are forced to be second, that Madame Renault lied for the sake of the man she loved, or, in other words, for the sake of Georges Canot. You agree with that? Yes, I admit it. It seems logical enough. Bien. Madame Renaud loves Georges Canot. Who then is Georges Canot? The tramp. Have we any evidence to show that Madame Renaud loved the tramp? Very well, then. Do not cling to theories where facts no longer support them. Ask yourself instead who Madame Renaud did love. I shook my head, perplexed. Mais oui, you know perfectly who did Madame Renaud love so dearly that when she saw his dead body, she fell down in a swoon. I stared. Dumbfounded. Her, her husband, I gasped. Poirot nodded. Her husband, or Georges Canot, whichever you like to call him. I rallied myself. But it's impossible. How impossible did we not agree just now that Madame de Broy was in a position to blackmail Georges Conan. Yes, but, and did she not effectively blackmail Monsieur Renaud? That may be true enough, but, and is it not a fact that we know nothing of Monsieur Renaud's youth and upbringing, that he springs suddenly into existence as a French-Canadian exactly twenty-two years ago? All that is so, I said more firmly, but you seem to me to be overlooking one salient point. What is it, my friend? Why, we have admitted Georges Canot planned the crime. That brings us to the ridiculous statement that he planned his own murder. Eh bien, mon ami, said Poirot placidly, that is just what he did. So that concludes chapter 20 of The Murder on the Links. I do hope you enjoyed listening to this reading and that you're not too confused by the latest discovery. Please join me back here soon. Sleep time.